box in my desk drawer. Be careful what you wish for. It was a particularly stressful place. Imagineering in general is actually not so Maalox laden, but the lab I was in, oh, John left in the middle. And it was a lot like the Soviet Union. <laughs> it was a little dicey for a while. Uh, but it worked out okay. And if they had said, stay here or never walk in the building again, I would have done it. I would have walked away from tenure. I would have just done it. But they made it easy on me. They said, you can have your cake and eat it too. And I basically become a day a week, day -a -week consultant for Imagineering. And I did that for about 10 years. And that's one of the reasons you should all become professors. <laughs> right? Because you can have your cake and eat it too. Okay. Uh, I went on and consulted on things like Disney Quest, so there was the virtual jungle cruise, and the best interactive experience I think ever done, and Jesse Shell gets the credit for this, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, wonderful at Disney Quest. Um, and so those are my childhood dreams, and you know, that's pretty good. I felt good about that. So then the question becomes, how can I enable the childhood dreams of others? And again, boy, am I glad I became a professor. What better place to enable childhood dreams? Eh, maybe working at EA, I don't know. That'd probably be a good close second. But, uh, and <laughs> this started in a very concrete realization that I could do this. Because a young man named Tommy Burnett, when I was at the University of Virginia, came to me, was interested in joining my research group. And uh, we talked about it. And he said, oh, and I have a childhood dream. Well, <laughs> it gets pretty easy to recognize them when they tell you. Uh, <laughs> And I said, yes, Tommy, what is your childhood dream? He said, I want to work on the next Star Wars film. Now, you've got to remember the timing on this. Where is Tommy? Tommy is here today. What year would this have been, your sophomore year? Oh. It was around 1993. Are you, are you breaking anything back there, young man? OK, all right. So in 1993, and I said to Tommy, you know they're probably not going to make those next movies. <laughs> And he said, no, they are. <laughs> and Tommy worked with me for a number of years as an undergraduate and then as a staff member. And then when I moved to Carnegie Mellon, every single member of my team came from Virginia to Carnegie Mellon, except for Tommy, because he got a better offer. <laughs> and he did indeed work on all three of those films. So, uh, and then I said, well, that's nice, but you know, one at a time is kind of inefficient. And people who know me know that I'm an efficiency freak. So I said, can I do this in mass? Can I get people turned in such a way that they can be turned on to their childhood dreams? And I created a course, I came to Carnegie Mellon, and I created a course called Building Virtual Worlds. It's a very simple course. How many people here have ever, ever been to any of the shows? OK, so you have a, some of you have an idea. For those of you who don't, the course is very simple. There are 50 students drawn from all the different departments of the university. There are randomly chosen, te randomly chosen teams, four people per team, and they change every project. A project only lasts two weeks, so you do something, you make something, you show something, then I shuffle the teams, you get three new playmates, and you do it again. And it's every two weeks, and so you do five projects during the semester. Uh, the first year we taught this course, it is impossible to describe how much of a tiger by the tail we had. I was just running the course because I wanted to see if we could do it. We had just learned how to do texture mapping on 3D graphics, and we could make stuff that looked half decent, but you know, we were running on really weak computers by current standards. But I said, I'll give it a try. And at my new university, I made a couple of phone calls, and I said, I want to cross-list this course to get all these other people. And within 24 hours, it was cross-listed in five departments. I love this university. I mean, it's just, a, it's the most amazing place. And I said, and the kids said, well, what content do we make? I said, hell, I don't know. You make whatever you want. Uh, two rules, no shooting violence and no pornography. Not because I'm opposed to those in particular, but, you know, that's been done with VR, right? <laughs> and you'd be amazed how many 19-year-old boys are completely out of ideas when you take those off the table. <laughs> Anyway, so I, I taught the course. The first assignment, I gave it to them. They came back in two weeks, and they just blew me away. I mean, the work was so beyond, literally, my imagination. Because I'd copied the process from Imagineering's VR lab, but I had no idea what they could or couldn't do with it as undergraduates, and, how, because their, and their tools were weaker. And they came back in the first assignment, and they did something that was so spectacular that I literally did 10 years as a professor, and I had no idea what to do next. 
So I called up my mentor. I called up Andy Van Dam. And I said, Andy, I just gave a two-week assignment, and they came back and did stuff that if I'd given them a whole semester, I would have given them all A's. Sensei, what do I do? <laughs> and Andy thought for a minute, and he said, you go back into class tomorrow, and you look them in the eye, and you say, guys, that was pretty good, but I know you can do better. And that was exactly the right advice, because what he said was, you obviously don't know where the bar should be, and you're only going to do them a disservice by putting it anywhere. And boy, was that good advice, because they just kept going. And during that semester, it became this underground thing. I'd walk into a class with 50, with 50 students in it, and there were 95 people in the room, <laughs> because it was the day we were showing work and people's roommates and friends and parents. <laughs> I've never had parents come to class before. <laughs> it was flattering and somewhat scary. And so it, it snowballed and we had this bizarre thing of, well, we gotta share this. If there's anything I've been raised to do, it's to share. And I said, we gotta show this at the end of the semester. We gotta have a big show. And we booked this room, economy. I have a lot of good memories in this room. And we booked it not because we thought we could fill it, but because it had the only AV set up that would work, because this was a zoo. Right, computers and everything. Uh, <clears throat> and then we filled it. And we more than filled it. We had people standing in the aisle. I will never forget the dean at the time, Jim Morris, was sitting on the stage right about there. We had to kind of scoot him out of the way. Uh, and the energy in the room was like nothing I had ever experienced before. And, and President Cohen, Jerry Cohen, uh, was there. And, and he, he sensed the same thing. He later described it as like an Ohio State football pep rally, <laughs> except for academics. And, and he came over and he asked exactly the right question. He said, before you start, he said, I gotta know, where are these people from? He said, the audience, what departments are they from? And we polled them and it was all the departments. And I felt very good because I had just come to campus, he had just come to campus, and my new boss had seen in a very corporal way that this is the university that puts everybody together. And, and that made me feel just tremendous. Uh, so we did this campus-wide exhibition. People perform down here. They're in costume. And we project just like this. And you can see what's going on. Uh, you can see what they're seeing in the head mount. Uh, there's a lot of big props. So there's a guy uh, uh, whitewater rafting. Uh, this is uh, Ben and E.T. Um, and yes, I did tell them if they didn't do the shot of the kids biking across the moon, I would fail him. That is a true story. Uh, and I thought I'd show you just. Uh, so I thought I'd show you just one world. And if we can get the lights down, if that's at all possible. Um, no, okay, that means no. All right. Uh, all right, we'll just do our best then. Oh, hello there. <laughs> I'm lonely. Make me a world. <laughs> Yay! this on its head. Watch closely. The world doesn't want to go on to the next thing in the show. So she's ready to move on, and it's not. <laughs> what? 
What are you doing? <laughs> Can't end this now. But there are so many other worlds that have to go. But our world is the best world. Hey, 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 no! It was an unusual course, <laughs> with some of the most brilliant creative students from all across the campus. Uh, <clears throat> it, it just was a joy to be involved with. Uh, and they took the whole stage performance aspect of this way too seriously. Um, uh, <laughs> and it became this campus phenomenon every year. People would line up for it. It was very flattering. and. Uh, it gave kids a chance of a sense of excitement of putting on a show for people who were then excited about it. And I think that that's one of the best things you can give somebody, the chance to show them what it feels like to make other people get excited and happy. I mean, that's a tremendous gift. We always tried to involve the audience, whether it was people with glow sticks or batting a beach ball around or driving. Yeah. <clears throat> this is really cool. This technology actually got used at the Spider-Man 3 premiere in LA. So the audience was controlling something on the screen. So that's kind of nice. Um, and I don't have a, a class picture from every year, but I dredged all the ones that I do have. And all I can say is that what a privilege and an honor it was to teach that course for something like 10 years. And <clears throat> um, all good things come to an end, and I stopped teaching that course uh, about a year ago. Um, people always ask me, what was my favorite moment? I don't know if you can have a favorite moment, but boy, there's one I'll never forget. <laughs> uh, this was a, a world with, I believe, a roller skating ninja. And one of the rules was that we performed these things live, and they all had to really work, and the moment it stopped working, we went to your backup videotape. And this was very embarrassing. So we have this ninja on stage, and he's doing this roller skating thing, and the world, it did not crash gently. <laughs> And I come out, and I believe it was Steve Audio, wasn't it? Was it? Where is he? Okay, where is Steve? Ah, my man, Steve Audio. And talk about quick on your feet, right? I say, Steve, I'm sorry, but your world has crashed, and we're going to go to videotape. And he pulls out his ninja sword and says, I am dishonored, blah, and just drops. <laughs> And so I think it's very telling that my favorite moment in 10 years of this high technology course was a brilliant ad lib. And then when the videotape is done and the lights come up, he's lying there lifeless and his teammates drag him off. It was really a fantastic moment. Um, and the course was all about bonding. People used to say, well, you know, what's going to make for a good world? I said, I can't tell you beforehand, but right before they present it, I can tell you if the world's good just by the body language. If they're standing close to each other, the world is good. All right. And BBW was a pioneering course. And uh, um, I, I won't bore you with all the details, but uh, it, it wasn't easy to do. 
uh, and I was given this uh, when I stepped down from the ETC, and I think it's, it's emblematic. If you're going to do anything that's pioneering, you will get those arrows in the back, and you just have to put up with it. I mean, everything that could go wrong did go wrong, but at the end of the day, a whole lot of people had a whole lot of fun. Uh, when you've had something for 10 years that you hold so precious, it's the toughest thing in the world to hand it over. And the only advice I can give you is find somebody better than you to hand it to. And that's what I did. There was this uh, kid at the VR studio way back when. And you didn't have to spend very long in Jesse Shell's orbit to go, the force is strong in this one. <laughs> and one of my, great, my two greatest accomplishments, I think, for Carnegie Mellon were that I got Jessica Hodgins and Jesse Shell to come here and join our faculty. And I was thrilled when I could hand this over to Jesse. And to no one's surprise, he has really taken it up to the next notch. And uh, you know, the, the course is in more than good hands, it's in better hands. Uh, but it was just one course. And then we really took it up a notch. And we, uh, we created what I would call the dream fulfillment factory. Uh, Don Marinelli and I got together and with the university's blessing and encouragement, we made this thing out of whole cloth that was absolutely insane, should never have been tried. All the sane universities didn't go near this kind of stuff, creating a tremendous opportunistic void. Uh, so the Entertainment Technology Center was all about artists and technologists working in small teams to make things. It was a two-year professional master's degree and Don and I were two kindred spirits. We're very different. Anybody who knows us knows that we're very different people. Uh, and we like to do things in a new way. And the truth of the matter is that we're both a little uncomfortable in academia. I used to say that I'm uncomfortable as an academic because I come from a long line of people who actually worked for a living. So, uh, <laughs> I detect nervous laughter. All right. <laughs> Uh, and I want to stress, Carnegie Mellon is the only place in the world that the ETC could have happened, by far, the only place. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, this picture was Don's idea, okay? <laughs> uh, and we like to refer to this picture as uh, Don Marinelli on guitar and Randy Pausch on keyboards. <laughs> but we really did play up the left brain, right brain, and it worked out really well that way. Um, uh, Don is an intense guy. <laughs> and Don and I shared an office. And at first it was a small office. We shared an office for six years. Right? Now, those of you who know Don know he's an intense guy. Right? And uh, you know, given my current condition, somebody was asking me, uh, this is a terrible joke, but I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, because I know Don will forgive me. Uh, somebody said, given your current condition, have you thought about whether you're going to go to heaven or hell? And I said, I don't know, but if I'm going to hell, I'm due six years for time served. But uh, <laughs> I kid. Sharing an office with Don was really like sharing an office with a tornado, right? There was just so much energy, and you never knew which trailer was next, right? <laughs> but you knew something exciting was going to happen. And and there was so much energy. And I do believe in, in giving credit where credit is due. So in my typically visual way, right, uh, if Don and I were to split the success for the ETC, he clearly gets the lion's share of it. He did the lion's share of the work. Okay? He had the lion's share of the ideas. It was a great teamwork. I think it was a, a great yin and a yang, but it was more like yin and yang. Right? Uh, and he deserves that credit, and I, and I give it to him because the, the ETC is a wonderful place. And uh, you know, he's now running it, and he's taking it global. We'll talk about that in a second. Describing the ETC is really hard, and I finally found a metaphor. Telling people about the ETC is like describing Cirque du Soleil if they'd never seen it. Sooner or later, you're going to make the mistake. You're going to say, well, it's like a circus. And then you're dragged into this conversation about, oh, how many tigers? How many lions? Right? How many trapeze acts? And that misses the whole point. So when we say we're a master's degree, we're really not like any master's degree you've ever seen. Here's the curriculum. Uh, the curriculum ended up looking like this. All I want to do is visually communicate to you that you do five projects in building virtual worlds, then you do three more. All of your time is spent in small teams making stuff. None of that book learning thing. Don and I have no patience for the book learning thing. It's a master's degree. They already spent four years doing book learning. Right? By now they should have read all the books. <laughs> uh, 
the keys to the success were that Carnegie Mellon gave us the reins, completely gave us the reins. We had no deans to report to. We reported directly to the provost, which is great because the provost is way too busy to watch you carefully. <laughs> Uh, we were given explicit license to break the mold. It was all project-based. It was intense. It was fun. And we took field trips. Every spring, uh, spring semester in January, we'd take all 50 students in the first year class, and we'd take them out to shots at Pixar. We'd take them to Pixar, Industrial Light and Magic. And of course, when you got guys like Tommy there acting as host, first thing, they put in writing, we promise to hire your students. Uh, I've got the EA and Activision ones here. I think there are now... How many? Five? I, 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 I drew nose, I bet. Uh, so there are five written agreements. I don't know of any other school that has this kind of written agreement with any company. And so that's a real statement. And these are multiple year things. So they're agreeing to hire people for summer internships that we have not admitted yet. That's a pretty strong statement about the quality of the program. Uh, and Don, as I said, he's now, he's, he's crazy. And you know, I mean that in, in a wonderful complimentary way. He's doing these things where I'm like, oh my god. you know, he's. He's not here tonight because he's in Singapore, because there's going to be an ETC campus in Singapore. There's already one in Australia, and there's going to be one in Korea. So this is becoming a global phenomenon. So I think this really speaks volumes about all the other universities. It's really true that Carnegie Mellon is the only university who can do this. We just have to do it all over the world now. <laughs> okay. uh, one of the big success about the ETC is teaching people about focus. Oh, now I hear the nervous laughter from the students. <laughs> I had forgotten the delayed shock therapy effect of these bar charts. Um, when you're taking building virtual worlds, every two weeks we get peer feedback. We put that all into a big spreadsheet. And at the end of the semester, you had three. And that's OK, because I can see it. And the vision is clear. Millions of key, and I was taking something called the theory qualifier, um, which I can definitively say is the second worst thing in my life after chemotherapy. <laughs> And I was complaining to my mother about how hard this test was and how awful it was. And she just leaned over and she patted me on the arm and she said, we know how you feel, honey. And remember, when your father was your age, he was fighting the Germans. <laughs> After I got my PhD, my mother took great relish in introducing me as this.